Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, I'm going to be talking about youth digital activism. Um, and this is going to be a survey of how youth are on the vanguard for innovation and the use of social media for political purposes around the world. Um, does anybody recognize where this graffiti might be coming from? Turkey. Turkey. It is Turkey. This is from Istanbul. This was during the Gezi Park protest just a couple years ago. Um, this says in Turkish, resist Gezi Park. Um, and uh, what's fascinating about Gezi Park as it applies to this is it's one of those kind of uprisings that social media was so important uh, for. Um, Turkey's not so great on press and media freedom. Um, they... <laughs> They are they're what's called a formal democracy, um, which is a euphemism for democracy in name only. And uh, they have a bad habit of shutting off the internet or slowing it down when something bad happens, including the recent bombings in Ankara just a few weeks ago. Um, during the Gezi Park protests, actually, uh, on CNN, Turkey, while those protests were happening in uh, Taksim Square, Gezi Park, um, CNN Turkey was showing a documentary about penguins in Antarctica. Um, and the penguin actually ended up becoming a, a mascot for the movement. Uh, social media was incredibly important for information dissemination during that period of time. And young people were really involved heavily in a lot of that work, as they are in a lot of these efforts, social movements, as we've heard before, um, around the world. I'm going to frame this by talking about how youth get into political practice often right now. And they do it through what some scholars are starting to describe as participatory politics. So these are interactive, peer-based acts through which individuals and groups seek to exert both voice and influence on issues of public concern. So this is key in that there's an interest from young people that these be non-institutional. Um, that they be more two-way as opposed to one-way, that they have a say in these things. They're able to actually express their voice and have influence. It's also a, a lot of creative acts. They like to make things and share things. Um, and and they often have a starting point of passion and interest in an issue as opposed to um, kind of a more comprehensive ideology. Does that resonate with anybody here as, a, as an approach to politics? Um, and so today is kind of going through all of the ways that, that young people are trying to exert their voice and have influence in the world. Come, some examples uh, that are kind of telling. Some trends that, that, that kind of get us here. Um, if you look at a survey uh, from the LSE of European uh, young people, you see that there is, a green, there is a growing interest in politics. So even before you can vote, there, there's this trend line until, until that voting age where you're like, I am I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in being empowered and voting. That's what those blue and orange lines represent. Um, that red line, though, is when they get to that point of voting and they're like, why shouldn't I participate? What, why shouldn't I buy into this system? And they blame the politicians. They see, they mistrust politicians, they mistrust the systems, and they don't want to play in a corrupt system. Um, and so it makes a lot of sense that we see this kind of interesting paradox in that we, we always worry about this, this failure of civics or this lack of political engagement from young people. But the reality is they actually just don't trust the way that we're supposed to do it traditionally. Um, and that they're actually very interested, in fact, their highest levels of volunteerism um, in several generations. It's also come to this point because of the technology, as Pat was bringing up earlier. Um, you spend 50 to 100% more time on their mobile device than on a desktop computer. And a mobile is a particularly good tool for participatory politics and for engaging in digital activism because it allows easy access to a lot of the tools you need to make media, share media, comment, and, and, and coordinate with other people. Um, and why are they spending so many hours? Well, it's because you all have smartphones. Uh, the penetration rate on smartphones, at least in the US, Canada, and the UK, is, um, is all above 90%. So nine in 10 of you have a smartphone, uh, which is pretty amazing and pretty powerful, um, quite honestly. 
So let's talk about a, diff a couple of different ways that you might be uh, voicing or expressing yourself in this moment. We talked about social movements already. I'll just kind of focus that in on, on what my community of scholars likes to call network social movements. Um, we'll talk about issue-oriented activism. Um, this is kind of falling off that issue and passion basis by which uh, participatory politics is often inspired. We'll also talk about participatory culture. So this is actually the sharing of a lot of the imagery media, creation of, of, of video, and what that means for all of this political engagement. And I'll also get into some interesting new trends um, in actually designing tools to do political engagement. This kind of moment of civic hacking that's seeing a lot of growth right now. And then hacktivism, which has been a kind of controversial trend, um, as you've seen in expressions like anonymous. So just return to this network social movement thing. We've already talked a lot about social movements. We talked a lot about the Arab Spring. I just want to highlight the fact um, of the technology involved here, um, that in Tunisia, you had vast networks of activists that had already been working toward this toppling, um, but they were helped a lot by organizations like Nawat, um, which were specifically act, um, organizing people and teaching them how to use Twitter, blog, YouTube, Facebook for activist purposes. So this was people training other people to be ready for a type of digitally enabled network social movement. Now, I want to focus here on that networked part because um, in many ways, the forms of political expression that are resonating with, with young people um, take on a network type of structure. And that doesn't necessarily just mean it's happening you know, on a social network. It also means that we're seeing less hierarchical forms of, of organizing. Um, we're seeing uh, easier diffusion across a, a broader scale. And these are properties of a network organization. Now, there are critics that say social movements have always operated this way, um, and, there's, and I think those are totally valid as well. But there is something interesting about this moment that we want to highlight as different. Um, also, you see in, in, in the case of Egypt, which followed after Tunisia, that also had the case where there were huge numbers of activists that had already been organizing for the, for the fall um, of the president at that time. Uh, but there was this amazing uh, Facebook page, We're All Khalid Saeed, uh, which act as a kind of flashpoint for thinking about how we could all have a, a, a singular moment by which um, we could reflect on and say, hey, on January 25th, this is why we're going out there and have that resonate with a large number of people because of this particular individual. So I just wanted to highlight those particular aspects of network social movements, but we've already talked a lot about that. So we'll move on to issue-oriented activism. Uh, who remembers Coney 2012? Can I see a raise of hands? Oh, excellent. How many people watched the 20-minute documentary? Okay, a few of you. What's amazing is this was um, a form of activism that relied on a 20-minute documentary. Who watches video that long online? Not many people. Um, but there was an interesting combination of traditional organizing by Invisible Children, this organization that for years had been trying to draw attention to Joseph Kony, this rebel leader in Central Africa, um, and his... Um, use of child soldiers in a lot of his um, war mongering there. And, uh, and they managed to bring in millions of youth through youth, uh, through uh, church youth groups. That was one of their uh, core bases, and they distributed media kits. But what was interesting about Coney 2012 is they brought out this documentary, and they asked everybody to tweet at a celebrity. They had suggested tweets, and they were like, Taylor Swift, this is one of our key culture influencers. Everybody tweet at her to watch this documentary and sign our pledge. And they had a range of people. They had Mark Zuckerberg, they had Ellen DeGeneres, um, they had politicians, all of these people that they thought were going to be important um, to getting awareness. And it was really successful. You had celebrities retweeting these things, saying that they would take a stand on it. Um, it was really complicated because uh, not everybody fully understood what they were signing up for um, as they were getting tweeted at by all of their fans. But it was a really important moment in terms of how uh, young people uh, were using a technology and being asked to use a technology in a particular way that brought huge awareness to an issue almost overnight. So what's another form of this kind of single issue activism? Who remembers uh, this campaign, the red equal sign campaign on Facebook? Um, so this was back in March uh, 2012, 
And uh, the human rights campaign had been working toward marriage equality issues for many years. They had been focusing on two United States Supreme Court decisions. And they wanted something unique that would allow people to express their solidarity with this. And already young people at much higher rates than their parents and former generations are sympathetic to LGBT issues and to the issue of marriage equality. Um, and so it resonated with millions of people who uh, changed their profile photo to this uh, to this image, um, and then created their own versions of it. It was kind of an amazing opportunity for remixing and, you know, like, how are you going to personalize it? Maybe it was about bacon. Maybe it was about Grumpy Cat. Uh, maybe it was about Yoda offering some wisdom. Like, all these different ways that people could take that meme, make it their own, and that allowed it to spread even further, um, which was a really beautiful moment in terms of, like, how we're using these technologies to spread awareness um, about a particular issue. So let's talk about participatory culture. Uh, who has heard of Harry Potter? We'll start with that one. <laughs> Everybody, who has heard of the Harry Potter Alliance? No one in this room. You guys should know about Harry Potter Alliance. So the history of fan activism is largely about folks who were trying to kind of tell corporate owners of the media properties that they love. These are like Star Trek fans, you know, that are like, I don't appreciate what you're doing with the Star Trek narrative right now, you know? And so they would organize together and petition um, the media companies to say, this is how the fans think this should work. And you should listen to us because we buy your stuff. <laughs> now, this has morphed into this beautiful moment um, where you're able to leverage many more people and there's this awesome form of, of popular culture in Harry Potter, in these kind of teen fiction uh, narratives, um, that uh, Andrew Slack, who started Harry Potter Alliance, noticed that he could tap into. This is now has 20 chapters. This has chapters in 20 countries around the world. These are fans of Harry Potter who actually do, like, they, they try and think about how they can be a Dumbledore's army for the real world. <laughs> And so they make connections between the themes in Harry Potter and real world issues. Um, and they've had really high profile successes. They have a, a campaign called Accio Books in terms of recruiting lots and lots of books to donate to, um, to libraries all across the world. Um, they've also been working on other media properties like The Hunger Games, and they did this high profile activism called The Odds in Our Favor, which is about raising awareness around in income inequality, which is of course the crux of The Hunger Games. And so people were asked to, um, to share their Hunger Games story and show the rebel salute in a video recording that, and they got thousands of young people to do this um, and create awareness around income inequality based on this connection to pop culture. Pop culture is also about humor. It's one of the most powerful tools that we have. Um, it's, it's always been a mainstay of the activist repertoire. And the most potent and easy to use form of humor online is the image macro. That's what this type of meme is. When you take a photo and you put big white text, usually impact font, on top of that photo um, with something a little clever on it. And so we talked uh, a little bit about ISIS and how good they are at using social media. Um, well, there are also people fighting back. Um, with their own anti-terrorist memes. We have these lovely Osama bin Laden uh, ones, the Hide and Seek Champion, 2001 to 2011. Uh, it's pretty funny. And there's a little reference to finding the PlayStation um, in his bunker uh, in Pakistan. Um, there was also this guy, uh, this 32-year-old guy who created a meme called Isis Karaoke, where he started taking pop lyrics and putting them on top of photos that were snapshots from Isis campaign videos. Um, and this sparked a whole group of people that started contributing these um, because there's just such a beautiful dissonance between the pop lyrics and these hardcore Isis, um, you know, terrorist activists, you know, um, ringleaders. And so... Uh, there's something beautiful about people coming together here as an entry point to political activity by sharing something humorous. Um, because it's so natural to do that online already. And you have to get, you have to understand that political issue well enough to make the joke work. And so there's an opportunity for political learning um, and civic engagement that goes a lot deeper than most people would think here. It's also spread a lot further than you might imagine. 
Myanmar has only recently got the internet. Um, but when they got the internet, they also got political memes uh, almost immediately. This is from a Facebook group uh, with the very tiny, we're talking about like less than 2% of the population having any access to the internet. Basically all of that internet population are in the same Facebook group. Uh, and they share memes like this, which are anti-government. Um, and so this one is in particular using the condescending Wonka meme, which is a very uh, American meme, uh, but very popular on the internet to kind of talk about uh, corruption in the government. The other most popular meme to talk about in Myanmar is the cost of, of uh, cell phone data, uh, which is just ridiculously high and has been a long-term uh, kind of activist position for them now. <laughs> Moving on to this next genre, civic hacking. This is where we kind of uh, take a step back from, from some of these forms of using social media to in many ways creating your own social media uh, tools and platforms. Um, now a lot of civic hacking has been formalized recently by governments and by corporations. These are the type of hackathons where you're like build a civic app for, app for your city or learn to code by using open data you know, from the government. Uh, Code for America is a big sponsor of these things. Um, but there are also activists that have had really high profile successes in building these tools. Um, who here has heard of TextMob before? Anybody? Oh, we got a few folks. Who here has heard of Twitter? <laughs> so TextMob directly inspired Twitter and was used during the 2004 Republican conventions um, in order to coordinate uh, protesters there. It was also used during the Orange Revolution in Kiev to coordinate protesters. This was just a basic CMS tool that routed your messages to a larger group of people such that you could coordinate, you could learn about if police were coming, and get the heck out of there. Um, really powerful effective tool, basically young people, activists who built this in order to be their own social media for activist purposes. Here's an example from Russia. Um, we have our Russian speaker in the audience. This is Kartopomoshi, which is uh, the help map. And uh, help map was brought about during the 2010 Russian wildfires. The government was not responding to the needs of the people in the outskirts of Moscow. And so they built this system to help people uh, source um, the, the kind of help needed for all these pe people that were affected by the fire. So it was, it was a routing system that would allow people to map their needs on a map and then people say, I will provide that, that for you. Um, and they, they won an, uh, an award from, uh, from the Russian government for building this, um, which is a little funny because it, it was actually a criticism of the Russian government um, was the reason that they had to, to build the thing in the first place. Once again, young people building this. Hacktivism. Now let's get into the controversial territory, um, if you haven't found it controversial up to this point. So hacktivism is kind of groups of technologically adept youth that are attracted to those anti-government and anti-corporate politics. So these are the folks that are far on the side of the participatory politics spectrum. Um, and unlike civic hack hacking, which is largely constructive, um, while also potentially activist. Hacktivism represents kind of a more controversial genre where they're seeing the internet as a site for disruptive protest. So within the hacktivist repertoire, um, we have examples of folks like contributing to WikiLeaks. Uh, now WikiLeaks has very clear political goals. Um, you may not agree with them, um, but they're so similar to many open data activists that are part of the, the kind of civic hacking movement. Um, and of course, WikiLeaks is about leaking sensitive documents and helping to maintain an infrastructure for anonymous submissions. That's what these kind of hacktivists were helping WikiLeaks do. Um, now, most notably, those affiliated with one or more of Anonymous's uh, incarnations in the past kind of half decade, um, they've developed a set of tactics for um, what we might think of as culture jamming or vandalism online. This is replacing web pages with political manifestos. Um, definitely hacking into web servers to do so. Um, they've had their own versions of picket lines and roadblocks. Uh, these would be in the form of what's called distributive denial of service attacks or DDoS, where they actually take down web servers by flooding them with data. Um, they have their own little social media tool for this called the Low Orbit Ion Cannon, which allows anybody to press a button and flood uh, traffic to these servers and take them down. Um, this isn't just used for um, taking down corporations, though, um, or government sites in the US. This was used in support of the Arab Spring. 
They had Operation Tunisia, which was done by a, a group of anonymous activists who actually took down, you know, like the president of Tunisia's website and the government of Tunisia's website. And it was their way of showing solidarity with those types of movements. Now, of course, most of these things, whether you do them offline, that type of vandalism or disruptive protest, or online, um, are illegal. Um, and that has made this very controversial. And what's particularly controversial for folks um, that, that want to see this as a legitimate form of political speech uh, is that internet law actually makes these uh, even worse in terms of the judge and jury and your ultimate sentence than the equivalents offline. They're considered as very serious offenses. Um, and we've had folks arrested in six different countries for different operations that happened over 2010 and 2011 with fines um, going into the millions and threats of, of decades of jail time um, for the work that they were doing. So what are some challenges uh, for digital activism at this moment? Well, one of which is unclear impact and slacker activism. Uh, we also have unprotected civil rights and unfree internet, digital divides, technologies and communities that oppress. There are all these issues that are facing young people as they try and do this work and their ability to do this work. So I'll kind of go through these in turn. So slacktivism has been this criticism of uh, forms of social media protests, you know, the kind of like, you know, uh, Armchair activist uh, is, a, is a more traditional label for some of these folks, but that, you know, it just feel good, you know, that they can just retweet their thing or, um, or share a meme, and now they've participated, they've made an impact, right? Um, and so there's a lot of criticism that not only maybe that this is, um, this is not effectual, but that it might actually be detracting from social movements and other forms of political engagement. Um, where they're not doing the kind of organizational work that was necessary to sustaining traditional social movements that actually succeeded, um, which I think is a, is a very valid point. Um, a scholar at Tufts, Peter Levine, uh, you know, says more broadly, digital activism may not be able to achieve, the, or may only be able to achieve scale and diversity, but not depth or, or uh, sustainability, um, which is entirely possible. Um, let's talk about unprotected civil rights and an unfree internet. So surveillance is a big problem here. We talked about the Iran election, the Green Revolution back in 2009. Um, what you may not realize is that while we were enjoying all of that real-time information that was coming out of there, the Iran government was also enjoying all of that data and information that was coming out of there and we were using it actually to profile and target the individual activists that resulted in many, many arrests of the protesters because their photos were shared uh, online. In fact, it's suspected that Iran actually allowed the internet uh, to stay on so that they could collect this during that period of time. Right now, um, as of 2015, 15 uh, Reporters Without Borders counts 170 netizens um, are imprisoned. These are bloggers and digital activists around the world who have done the type of work that I've described already in this presentation and have been jailed for that work. Um, and so there are lots of um, trends by less open regimes um, than uh, the U.S.'s in terms of making these things illegal and targeting the folks that do this and seeing this thing as a major threat and not honoring freedom of speech. We don't, they don't have the freedom of speech that we do. And actually there's a trend for greater censorship um, and repression in many countries around the world at this moment. <coughs> digital divides are also a key problem here. Um, so we've heard about digital divides for many, many years. Almost as soon as we had the internet, we were thinking about digital divides and the lack of access that that meant for people to actually be able to use these tools, to have the internet, to have smartphones. 60% um, of the world, mostly women and girls, are still excluded from the web. Um, some of the places that, that this is worse are India. Um, and, and so I couldn't help but be amused when I looked for examples of uh, folks in India using technology to find these beautiful examples of mansplaining uh, by the dude who has the laptop um, and just allowing those women to look over his shoulder and see what he's able to do. The participation gap is another form of this digital inequality. This is something that's been theorized by Henry Jenkins and, and his colleagues, where it's not just about access, but it's about differentiated skill. That if you aren't getting the proper opportunities to create 
YouTube videos or share online and understand the opportunities to do so and what that means for, for your voice and influence, that, um, that you're not going to be a fully effective actor um, in the kind of civic realm in the future. And this is one of the things I'm very worried about, um, that we aren't thinking about how these types of digital skills are connected to the civic skills that are necessary to succeed right now. Technologies and communities that oppress. So the tools that we're using are often also the ones that are being used against us. It isn't just um, the fact that, that uh, the governments are surveilling, but that they're actively opposing us in many ways. Russia has been one of, on the forefront of this. Um, the YouTube video there is, is actually a video of, of um, folks in the public beating a LGBT um, activist uh, in the streets. And the Russian government has been basically silent on this issue and, and allowing folks to uh, multiply the harm by sharing these videos then, um, which go viral in some places in the Russian internet, um, making the embarrassment and pain even worse for those folks affected by it. Um, you also have the Russian government sponsoring what uh, the West, Western journalists have called the Troll Army. Um, and in this case, uh, the Troll Army um, are folks that are actually going out there and trying to tell folks that are unsympathetic to the Russian government that they're wrong and flooding spaces with misinformation um, and taking these folks down. And this is actually funded uh, through large amounts of money by the Russian government. Um, we also see cases like the recent um, presidential elections in Mexico in which both sides, or all sides, I should say, parties, were sponsoring Twitter bots that were actually advocating on behalf of their candidates and drowning out any real speech. So they would hop on these hashtags that were popular by the young people who were talking about their candidate and just flood it with crap, um, making Twitter unusable as, as a real place for discourse during that political um, uh, election. Um, and then in the US, very recently, we see expressions of the misogynism that, um, that kind of creeps up on the internet on a regular basis. Um, the Bernie Bros is one example of this. Who has heard of the Bernie Bros? Um, so these, this is kind of these, uh, these men who support um, Bernie Sanders who end up kind of piling on uh, women who support Hillary Clinton and using sexist takedowns, um, which, Clinton, which Bern Sanders has had to disavow publicly on several occasions because these supporters have kind of gotten out of hand. Um, Twitter really struggles with this stuff, um, and it's hard um, for us to, to be able to use these tools as effectively as we could because there are all of these um, kind of both positive and negative aspects that occur there. So just to wrap up, I think there are a couple of ways that we can support this work, support youth digital activists, um, one of the which is making sure that we grow a free and open internet, make sure that we teach digital and civic skills together. This is my pet project. Um, we also need to understand impact studies, see where, whether slacktivism is real, um, what its real impact is, and how valuable it really is. Because I think there's a lot of value there. I think these entry points that are new for political engagement are extremely valuable, and we should be taking them seriously and taking young people who practice them seriously. Um, and last but not least, we need to be taking the lead um, to make sure that, uh, that young people are included in all of these processes. Um, and are recognized for the work that they're doing. And that goes for pressuring the governments to do so as well. So I'll leave you with some of my favorite <laughs> election memes from 2012. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you for listening. I was mentioned, and in this